We are live uh, on uh, CNBC Africa. Now, the coronavirus has rewritten the rules of uh, many aspects of our lives in many ways that we are still grappling with. And uh, it has also worsened some of the challenges that we face, in particular here on the African continent. And one of those is around energy. We now sit with one of the most powerful African women who will be looking into energy on the continent on for, on behalf of the United Nations. And Amy is Damilola Agunbi. She is the special representative for sustainable energy for all. She's also the CEO and is also co-chair of the United Nations Energy. She joins us via, where are we now? Is it uh, Skype? Is it Zoom? We are Zooming. We are Zooming. She joins us uh, uh, from London. Damilola, thank you uh, for joining us. So, has the coronavirus changed the conversation around African energy from a UN perspective? I think from all perspectives, it's changed the conversation. First, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to be here today. I think what um, the COVID pandemic has shown is just how important energy access is and having sustainable energy, not just to deal with crisis, but it's also important for everyday life. Like it's important in terms of even lockdown to tell people to stay at home when they don't have access to electricity or have access to clean cooking is also hard. So I think it's amplified the effort and shown that, you know, having electricity and energy access is, is critical um, right now in Africa, but globally as well. All right, Damila, it's Kenneth from Lagos here, yeah, and um, I would like to build up on Godfrey's question and ask you about the, you know, it's a decade to the SDG targets that have been set, and we'll be talking about access to energy and SDG Goal 7. But I would like to get your thoughts on the importance of not losing the progress we've made so far to COVID-19. Obviously, that's a great question, and it is really important we don't lose the momentum. But the truth of it, we're going into the last 10 years, so everybody needs to refocus on more of an implementation-focused appeal. And that is why I really feel that this moment with COVID-19, especially for the continent, allows the continent to reset and put energy part of like the key agenda. We've just developed what we call the Recover Better with sustainable energy guide for African countries, which focuses specifically on this. What can African countries do now while there's like a global reset in terms of how you can actually use energy and sustainable energy to translate into more green jobs and also additional GDP. Yeah, I see Damilola, your, your language is littered with green, sustainability, etc., and all that. I want to quibble a little bit here, uh, Damilola, with you and say here in Africa, where you and I know almost two thirds of Africans have no access to any form of energy at all. It becomes difficult to talk sustainability, to talk green, when all we need at the moment is to be able to keep on the lights on. As I speak to you, here in South Africa, where we know there's got the, the biggest capacity in terms of energy supply, there are parts of this country today that are without energy because we just can't keep the lights on. I mean, you're absolutely correct. There are 565 million people still in Africa without power supply. Um, and it's I'm talking green and sustainable energy because that is the cheapest way to power all these people that we're talking about. I'm not saying that other types of fuels wouldn't come in terms of the energy transition. But the truth of the matter is most of the people that we are talking about, it's really an energy access point of view. And the cheapest, most sustainable way are off-grid solutions. And many of them are mini grids or solar home systems. So they actually by default are renewable. And they're also what we've determined the quickest way to electrify Africa. So this is all kind of looking at the data and the evidence, but you're correct. What does energy's clean energy transition look like? And it's not just about Africa's clean energy transition. It's, it's taking country by country and not lumping the same solutions that would be for South Africa, for Nigeria. They're different um, countries and they have different solutions. And one of the things we're doing is saying, what is that path to 2050 where you have um, net zero? But most important, how do you make sure people are electrified by 2030 at the same time? So how is the UN helping us, Damilola? 
Well, you are helping on all fronts. Obviously, there's a big climate movement. But in terms of my key focus in terms of energy and sustainable energy for all, what we're doing is really trying to work with governments and policymakers in, in how to implement their plans, right? So does, does Senegal have a proper integrated energy plan? How, how is it going to determine the least cost way to provide power to all the people within that country and also all the people that also need um, clean energy um, and sorry, clean cooking. So it's important that we, we dimension what it looks like and then try and encourage the DFIs and the private sector, put them all into the conversation. This isn't just like an Africa issue. This is actually a global issue. Africa only admits about 2% of global emissions right now, but we don't want that to increase. So we have to make sure the sustainability and the welfare and livelihoods of people are put first. All right, Namilola, um, I'd like to still go back to the green conversation Godfrey was started having with you and uh, talk about the need for sustainable finance models that we're seeing now. We've seen the rise of green bonds in there, but what has been the level of uptake and per uh, perception in the African continent? I mean, we've been really encouraged by the level of uptake in terms of green bonds and green financing, but there isn't enough of it. You know, there needs to be a lot more green climate financing channeled towards energy and also being done in a sustainable and quick way. Because, as you know, we're trying to achieve these targets by 2030. A lot of these projects really need to start now. So we are also championing a program called the Universal Energy Facility, which is basically a results based facility. And if I break it down, it means that when people are actually connected to electrification, they get grant support. As we know, a lot of African energy um, sector has been subsidized in the past. We just want to make sure there's a subsidy program that means you definitely have someone being connected but there isn't enough finance and that is one of the things we're trying to encourage it's probably about a 29 billion dollar a year problem um, that we need to fix in africa yeah you just anticipated my next question because i wanted to find out if the un is bringing a big bag of money one to solve this problem but i also wanted to add to that question i like the fact that you are talking about two things here that you are doing is quickest is cheapest solutions you are bringing solutions to the table. How does that work from a UN perspective to flow into the African countries that do require this energy? And of course, the person in the rural areas who wants to use that, that energy. I mean, at the end of the day, UN is always committed to the last mile and, and the most vulnerable people. So the solutions aren't just looking at people in the cities, but also looking at people in, in rural areas and people who do not have um, connections at all and they don't have access to clean cooking. But again, you know, to encourage the private sector to come in and to encourage the, the development finance institutions and, you know, foundations to also come in you need data and information and we're really pushing governments and helping them to gather the information on where are these people what are their energy needs what do they need energy for it's not good enough just to give people light as people call it it's all it's better to give them energy for some type of economic growth and that is what we're really pushing Right, Namilola, talking about ending energy poverty is no easy feat, but I would like to get what the UN's vision is for Africa's future energy mix. I mean, Africa's future energy mix, just like the rest of the world, we would prefer to be cleaner. Um, and that's why we're focusing on new technologies and ways to, to make it happen. Like I said, the evidence has shown that in terms of energy access and these people you're talking about in the rural areas and the most vulnerable populations, the actual you know, most affordable and cheapest way to electrify them is actually through renewables. So we're really pushing that. Um, and we are totally committed to 2030. I mean, it's a goal we've um, we set for the SDGs. And it's important that as we look at the sustainable um, development goals, we realize that like energy is that golden thread, right? If even if in healthcare, in agriculture, in industrialization, if you don't get your, your energy or your source of electrification right, it actually affects you achieving all your other sustainable development goals. I'm not too sure you answered my question about a UN big bag of money uh, to help Africa uh, sort out its problem, Damilola. Did you? <laughs> I didn't answer your question, but we're working <laughs> on it, sir. <so. laughs> Okay, we'll come back and talk about that big bag of money next time we uh, mm -hmm. have you on the program. I wanted to talk about uh, the issue of uh, uh, green energy versus uh, our traditional forms of energy. Is the debate around which is cheaper settled from a UN perspective? 
Oh, uh, definitely. I think people can see in terms of clean energy and traditional forms. Again, you know, you do have to separate conversations. Right now, our discussion is about clean energy in terms of the most vulnerable populations and energy access. So that's really on the household level. And I think the data has shown. And even on the industrialization level, you're seeing a lot more energy mixes with people wanting to introduce renewables as part of their as part of their programs. So I think that debate has settled. However, how to fund it sustainably and to make sure a, a lot more funding goes into it, you know, it's also driven by governments, right? They need to have the right types of policies and regulations to allow for a private sector driven clean energy solution within their countries. All right, Damala, still a huge focus on clean energy here, but I'm trying to understand how the COVID-19 pandemic will impact investment flows into the renewable, uh, the renewable energy pro project pipeline. I mean, COVID-19 affects any, everything, but what we're trying to emphasize is that this has shown us that energy access literally saves lives. So having power for healthcare is important and having power for the recovery is also important in terms of what, what shape does the recovery actually look like. Um, so in terms of the, the pandemic as such, right now it is, it is in a bad situation where we're finding a few of the most vulnerable people not having access because of the pandemic. However, what we're trying to say is that the stimulus packages or whatever is developed needs to focus on providing power to these people. That is how you get to economic growth. To give you an example, you get 3.5 more jobs from renewable energy than you do for the fossil equivalent. Um, you get 17 jobs from um, every million dollars spent on energy efficiency. You know, the, the numbers don't lie. And most important, you get 0 0.93 cents for every dollar spent on energy and additional GDP. So we want it to be firmly part of, you know, the recover, um, the recover better or the build back better for, for most of these countries. Yeah, cheapest and quickest. I've learned two things today and I'm going to keep them in my head and keep trying to learn about them. Damilola, let's talk about the holy cow. This is subsidies. Part of the reason that is given by people for the fact that we can't get enough money into the investment that's required for us to generate power is because governments refuse to let go. They want to sometimes subsidize. What is the best way of supplying uh, we could say it's uh, green energy in this new age that we're entering, or just any form of energy indeed. I think that it's, it's twofold. Um, subsidies happen all over the world. It's not an Africa issue. It also happens in the global north. And different ways people subsidize. Some people subsidize the tariff, um, and then it doesn't allow it to be a cost-reflective tariff. Some people subsidize um, fossil fuel, as you've seen in many African countries. What we are actually asking for now is a subsidy to connect customers. So people don't get payment until they actually connect customers. And that's what the universal energy facility is all about. And that's a form of subsidy that we believe has worked um, um, in Africa and is working more because what it makes sure is that more people are connected um, to, to the actual systems. But the way you subsidize is, is very, very important, especially in the African continent context. And that is what we're trying to challenge now and say that you have to get to cost reflective tariff because you have to have an even playing field for, for fossil and for clean clean energy. And then you also have to, you know, remove fossil fuels um, from, from the conversation, which we're seeing more and more countries doing now. We're very, we're very encouraged. Again, I'd like to say that we're talking about the clean energy transition. This is something that's going to take us about 20 decades, sorry, about two decades, about 20 to 30 years to actually achieve, but we need to start it now. Yeah. Uh, does the UN have a position in terms of uh, the role that government plays in electricity generation here I'm talking about before we talk about uh, the, the, the last mile? Well, are you talking about big um, IPP generation yes. or government providing? I I'm mean, again, trying to it find depends. The mix. Um, well, the, the mix now or what we're advocating now is more private sector driven. Um, intervention. So even if governments want to do large-scale generation projects, they should actually partner with generation companies. Um, but if you if we talk about the energy mix, I mean, we would hope 
there is a situation that, you know, in the next few years, you will see a lot more energy in terms of percentage wise, 30 or 40 percent of more energy that's generated in any country coming from renewables. And this is on grid and off grid as well. In the area of building capacity, yeah, Damala, in the area of building capacity and efficiency in the power systems in countries in Africa, I'd like to know how the UN is working with governments in Africa to help build capacity and even ensure that they get efficient power supply. I mean, one of the really interesting things about creating jobs and green jobs is the role of women, the role of gender as well. Um, in my previous role, I did a lot of work in terms of training young women for the clean energy space, and we're trying to continue that. We have a project called Women at the Forefront, and kind of looking at the whole um, supply value chain of everything from your installers to your assembly people to your cash management and seeing that what roles need to be fed, but not just training for training sake, training for programs and training for developers and, and making sure you keep that local content. And that is something that we are working very hard on and we hope to continue and, and replicate in different countries in Africa. Yeah. Earlier you referred to the $29 billion gap. I presume that this was uh, money that is required to uh, fund uh, sustainable energy projects. Is that correct? Yeah, so according to the International Energy Agency, um, you need about 40 billion um, annually for all, all energy um, to achieve that gap. But for Africa alone, it's about 28.6 billion a year that you would need um, till 2030. So tw let's talk 29 billion. Where do we find that money? One of the conversations we've been hearing around the African continent for the past few years is that we could find m this money uh, from uh, one pension funds that are invested in overseas markets where we know in many cases they earn very low returns. Secondly, there's been the suggestion of uh, using uh, foreign exchange reserves that many central banks from the African continent keep in uh, US or uh, British guilds or treasuries uh, as, uh, as, 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 as investment. Is that an, a, a source that you potentially could be advising governments to look at? But also to the point, I want to know what the UN position is in terms of finding that money. I don't know if we have a set position in terms of one source. I think one of the key things is like everything's on the table. With that kind of quantum of money, you need public sector money, you need private sector money, you need grant support, you need foundation money, you need blended finance, you need climate fund. There isn't, there isn't just one source of money. And you need all this money because you know that if you're putting it into giving power to Africans, it will yield additional GDP. So it's just good maths, really. It's like an investment. But there isn't just, oh, let's say one source, or it has to be pension funds. What we're looking at is a whole host of different funding sources. And we're also looking at how climate and energy, clean energy funds are done right now and seeing that is there an easier and quicker way of getting the money from the funds to the governments and the institutions that require them. All right, Damlola, looking at your interventions, though, I'd like to know how you're working to address the value chain challenges we're seeing from generation to distribution. Okay, again, my focus has been primarily now in terms of recover better on the off-grid sector. And we've seen a huge opportunity in terms of localization, especially in Africa. What COVID showed us was that even um, primary healthcare centers, let's take an example, Nigeria, that wanted to be powered by solar hybrid solutions, some of them were done, but then there was just like, we just ran out of lithium batteries in West Africa. So again, that's also an opportunity to say large scale assembly can actually be done in Africa. And there should be some choice continents that when you need, um, and again, I'll focus on solar equipment in terms of panels, inverters, batteries, or even solar home systems, you can buy it from a neighboring African country instead of always relying on it from China. We feel it will reduce the cost of doing projects, and most importantly, it would provide some type of energy security because the, the, the components to execute your projects will be you know, found in continent. As an African Damilola, I'm sure you have heard of the Grand Inga project in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which could be powering all of Africa, etc., etc., if it were developed and it is green. Um, 
My question is related to the ability of African governments to work together to ensure that they are able to put these projects on the line. Because we do know uh, that uh, on our own, as individual countries, we are unable to do so. Are you seeing any evidence that we're beginning to work up to this and are actually putting in practical terms work on the ground like we did with the Africa Continental Free Trade Area? Oh, definitely. I think what this pandemic has shown us that if we don't work together, you know, we will we will find a situation where everybody suffers. So I think there's a lot more discussion in terms of power pools, which I guess is what you're talking about. Transmission lines going, you know, through countries and being able to actually trade in terms of in terms of power. So those are large infrastructure projects. That, that are also critical for the growth of Africa. But I see a lot more, um, especially in the ECOWAS region and with the, with the um, AUC, a lot more working together. There's been a lot more teams on, okay, I'm doing this in my country. How can I help your country? And kind of put together um, solutions, which has been extremely encouraging. All right, Damilala, I would like to get back to the area of mini grids and their importance um, to rural electrification. And I would like you to speak to some of the workable models that you've, 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 you've put in place or worked on put together to get better project delivery outcomes. Yeah, well, mini grids, I think, is key. Um, I think in a in, in a continent like Africa, you could probably achieve 30% of the energy access issues. So that's, you know easily almost just over 200 million people connected to mini grids. Um, what the key area that we focus on and the, what we're championing, championing now is a re results-based financing model. And this is where you get private sector to provide mini grids, anything from 20 kilowatts to one megawatt um, within, within a community, distribute it, um, charge them an affordable tariff, but only once the developer has connected the customer is when they get paid the grant. Um, that is what we've seen has worked most efficiently um, across Africa. And that is what we're going to um, be, champ that's the model we're going to champion. Uh, very quickly, Damilola, we have happily run out of time because this has been a happy conversation, I think, for me, uh, for Ken as well. I wanted to know if we are seeing uh, more receptive African governments to advise on policy, uh, especially as it relates to regulation. Because, we, as we said earlier, money doesn't come in because we do not have the, have the correct policies. How large a gap remains? I mean, there's still a gap, um, but there are some countries that are being a lot more um, productive and progressive. I'll take uh, my country, Nigeria. There is a mini grid regulation in place. There is a results-based financing um, facility in place. And um, surprisingly as well, and very, very encouraging, in their um, sustainability plan, they have put 5 million connections from solar. So when you have large kind of oil and gas nations actually making commitments to clean energy, it's also very encouraging. But you know, I feel we're gonna get there very, very soon with a lot of the governments. Um, and you're know, just really looking forward to um, how to unleash Africa's potential um, when they have sustainable energy for, for all. Damilola, thank you. And keep knocking their heads. Keep knocking their heads. Hopefully we will get there uh, one day. Damilola Ogunbi is uh, the special representative for sustainable energy for all. She's also the CEO and co-chair of the United Nations Energy. Thank you. Ken, my colleague in Lagos, thank you. We, I know we woke you up a little bit early today, but it's all for a good cause. And thank you all uh, for watching live from Johannesburg this morning, where, by the way, we have got Lord Shady. There are parts of this city that don't have power, parts of this country that do not have power. We need it. And as she says, it is available, it is cheaper and quicker to get to market. How to get the governments to get it going? Thank you for watching. Thank you.